Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the sixth Live Discovery Doing Science Education Conference and our very first virtual conference. My name is Teresa Murad and I'm the Director of Education and Diversity Programs at the Ecological Society of America. We've had quite an adventure pulling this conference together. And the first conference actually was held in 2013 by a group of professional societies that formed a partnership to advance exchange and use of digital education resources through our digital libraries. And those, uh, uh, those partners are the Botanical Society of America, the Ecological Society of America, and the Society for the Study of Evolution. So together we are the life discovery partners. Uh, and we have remained together all these years uh, through the conference. Oops. Uh, and our objectives are to really help promote and foster communities of practice with using evidence based research, uh, uh, education materials, and also promote culture of publishing and informing educators about different strategies regarding careers in our field. So we are really excited that we have been able to do this for so many years and, uh, you know, and, and welcome you to, to this very event for the first time in a virtual format. Of course, this uh, event will not be, have been made possible without a very, very dedicated team of people. And here are our planning team. We have uh, a wonderful team from all over, uh, from our different societies in a, in a partnership. You will meet some of them as we go along. So I, I won't be reading the names to you, but uh, you will be meeting them individually. And also uh, to help us promote this event and to share the, the, the event to their networks are all our collaborators. So we're really happy to have such a wonderful group of uh, organizations and people who see the value of what we're doing. So thank you to our conference collaborators. And also, I would say that, uh, again, you know, without uh, staff, without people who are really working behind the scenes to put this together, it would have been impossible. So I really want to give credit to Jordan Macy, our education intern, who has helped us in so many ways to uh, help with the emails, with the promotions, and just with website, you know, all kinds of different things. And of course, Jessica Johnston, you, know, you have heard from her uh, a number of times. Uh, she has been really working, you know, day and night to make sure that this event goes smoothly. So thank you to Jordan and Jessica. And now I, I'd love to really hand over this uh, program to our conference chair, Andrew Martin. He has been with, uh, attended the, the meeting since I think the first one, and maybe he skipped one, I think, but, uh, and he's also been a uh, speaker at one of our events. So we are really thrilled to have uh, Andrew at the helm. And it is really uh, with great regret that we couldn't join him, uh, you know, at, at his neck of the woods there in Colorado, but uh, we're really happy to have him as our chair. And he has also worked so hard to put this program together. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand over the proceedings to Andrew. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Teresa and Jessica, and everybody else that played a role in developing the virtual format for this year's meeting that was going to be in Estes Park, where there's elk and the trees are changing, but we'll just have to enjoy our local environments. And I imagine that the local environments are incredibly diverse because people are joining from all over. I think we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 participants, which is more than twice what we typically have. So in this sense, it's a more inclusive meeting than we've, we've ever had. So um, like you can see, my name is Andrew Martin. I'm an ecologist and evolutionary biologist um, at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I'm a professor and chair of the department. And I also play a large role in promoting the adoption of best practices in, in teaching and mentoring early career faculty. So this year's theme is biology education in an evolving landscape. And the landscape is evolving in multiple ways as, as you probably have felt over the last couple of semesters. So the, being in a pandemic has changed the structure and function of how we teach, how we interact with each other, how we interact with students. And so there's, there's a lot to learn about pedagogy and how to teach ecology and science in this context. Um, in addition, there's, there's um, structural features that are changing the pedagogy as well that relate to how we develop frameworks for putting together curriculum, designing assessments, and, and, 
and it's really promoting ecological uh, thinking and being a good ecological citizen on the planet. And that's the 4D um, EE uh, framework that we'll be focusing on this morning. So overall, we're hoping that the virtual format that we've adopted allows us to maximize interaction time. And we're, we're gonna be using a whole bunch of different approaches to do so. Um, so let me just go through what those are. So our, every single day will pretty much look the same, although the people involved in the topics that we talk about are, will be different. So every day there'll be um, a brief introduction like the one today, and then they'll, we'll transition into a keynote. And that keynote starts at, um, at 9.15, or sorry, 11.15 Eastern Standard Time, and some other time if you live in another time zone. Um, and then following the keynotes, there'll be an education share fair. Um, there'll be a 4DE showcase. There'll be panel presentations, which involves um, a group of people who first interact on a panel, and then we do breakouts where each of the panel members um, gives a talk or a workshop on a topic um, uh, that falls with a particular theme. And then we'll end the day with a network, a set of networking topics. And all of those hopefully will be designed so that you can interact as much as possible, ask questions, um, write in the chat and various um, aspects that are, uh, that are allowed or enabled by the, the sort of Zoom format. So, one of the things to keep in mind is that all of the Zoom links are available on the um, ESC, ESA LDC site. So if you need to get, you know, you need to get the links, you can go there. And there's a there'll be a really prominently displayed purple button. Well, at least it looks purple to me. I'm slightly uh, colorblind. That says join now, and so you can just zoom right to the Zoom room. Let's see, um, a couple of just things to re remind you of is it's a good idea to sign on to Zoom early, right? So just, just in case, like I, I end up going to the airport way too soon because uh, something could happen. So that, that way you're just, you're insured to, to be there. Um, for problems, you can contact, can you change the slide? Yeah, you can contact, um, that email ldc at esa.org, or you can call that phone number. And the other piece that you should know about is that all plenaries um, will be recorded and made public. So you can access, access those after the meeting. Um, the specific program for today, well, let, no, wait a second, one more thing. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to remind you of and it's just really about making this experience as, as positive as, as possible. And we're, I know we're all sort of all dialed into that, especially since we're all ecologists and ecologists tend to be the most amazing people in the world. Um, so the goal here is to really help build community, just you know, that we can build community even though we're, um, we're more or less isolated during this pandemic. And uh, some of the goals for doing that is to make sure people know who you are. So, um, when you talk, rename, just go ahead and say who you are and include your affiliation so we can get um, connection both um, with the names that we are attached to faces and also between institutions. Um, and then the other thing we want to encourage you to do is just ask questions um, in the and, and chat as much as possible and just try to connect to each other as much as possible. I, I know I don't have to tell you that. But it's just a good reminder that this is an opportunity to maybe meet people you haven't met before and realize that you may be connected to them um, in ways that you weren't aware of by, uh, by talking to them or, or chatting with them. Um, you know, you want to basically use the strategies that we have in Zoom. So use those strategies like um, raise your hand, try to keep your comments in the chat brief. Um, if you've already spoken, try to give other people a chance, but we don't want to we don't want to um, limit your enthusiasm for a particular topic. Um, so go to the next slide. So the where we're going next is there'll be a keynote, and the keynote will start at eleven fifteen, 
and then it ends at 1215. There'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, Arietta, who I will introduce next, will tell you a little bit about how to ask questions in the webinar format. And so I wanna introduce Arietta at this point. And um, she's a professor at UC San Diego and she's been on the LDC planning committee for, uh, for about five years. And I discovered after Googling Arietta that um, we actually have three degrees of sort of, of research professional separation. So it turns out that one of the PhD students that I was on the committee for at UC, um, at UC Boulder, uh, John, uh, Joe Mahalvik, went and did a postdoc in Greg Dyer's lab where um, Arietta also I postdoc, I think, yes. And so what's, it's kind of cool to think that, you know, we are all interacting sort of in the same plane of existence. And it's really a pleasure to find people who you're connected to that you didn't even know you're connected to. And so I already know we share lots of um, sort of ideas and conceptual foundations in, in common. So she has an active program on the ev evolution and ecology of disease and discipline-based education research. And so I think what I'll do now is just uh, let Arietta take over. Great, thank you, Andy. I did not expect such an extensive introduction since I am only an introducer. <laughs> um, but uh, Teresa, should I wait till 8.15 to make sure we're on schedule or sorry, 11.15 Eastern? Or should we go ahead with the introductions for our keynotes? I think maybe you can start with the logistics um, Super. questions. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, you might have noticed that we are in our um, Zoom webinar format, which is a little different from a normal Zoom um, because we have this Q&A box. So um, feel free to use the chat for any kinds of community discussions, something that you want to add, but the chat will not be monitored by our speakers. So if you have a question for our speakers, please put that in the Q&A box. The Q&A box also lets you upvote other people's questions. So that means if there's a question already asked that you're interested in, um, it will let us see what, what the questions most people are interested in um, are. So uh, please use both of those. Um, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, um, we will ask you to raise your blue hand, not your actual on-camera hand, but your um, blue Zoom hand. So if you go to participants um, at the bottom of that, uh, so participants is an option at the bottom of your screen. If you go to that um, tab, there will be an option on the bottom that says raise hand. If you want, you can try it right now um, and make sure that's working. And then I'll just clear those, or I guess probably Jessica will clear those since I'm not a host. Um, great, we have some people raising their hands, excellent. Um, so it's up to you. If you prefer a text question, you can put it in the Q&A at any time. If you prefer to raise your hand, just wait for the end. So we're gonna have two different keynote speakers but one Q&A, right? So that we can treat this almost like a mini panel. So your questions will be saved until the end of our second speaker. Um, I think those are all the logistics. Oh, one more thing for logistics. Um, so it is not showing up right now. Um, could I ask our, our first speaker to go ahead and, and share your screen so that we can practice the um, view options for shared screen? Great, thank you. Um, right, so now you should have um, view options in a little bar at the top of your screen next to um, the green bar. And if you click on that, you can choose side-by-side -side mode. And that lets you see the speaker's camera on one side and their presentation um, on the other side. And you can even change the size of those so that you can see the presentation larger. Um, great, thank you. All right. Um, I guess we'll get started with our with our keynote. So um, I have the pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker. So as um, Andy mentioned, both of our keynotes today are on the ESA um, 4DEE um, project. Uh, and um, both of our speakers are on this steering committee. So our first speaker will be uh, Ken Klimo, who has over 30 years of, of experience working on these issues in eco-literacy um, and was one of the founding members of this committee. Um, 
He's a professor of biology at Wilkes University and got his PhD from SUNY Syracuse. Uh, and his, his research in part focuses on um, biology education and as you can imagine, eco-literacy, but also um, issues in particular of how to teach um, energy. So this idea of um, energy as, a, as an interdisciplinary concept connecting um, across fields, including ecology. So I'm gonna keep this short so that we can save our time to hear from our speakers who are the ones you're waiting for. So um, yes, please, please welcome Ken Klimo. All right, so thank you. So can you, I guess you can hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. okay, and you can see me moving and so you can see the, uh, the, the um, screen that I have up. So again, Ken Klimo from Wilkes University. Um, I teach biology and ecology, botany and energy. Um, and I'm also the department chair of the biology department. So I have the distinct pleasure of presenting this keynote address uh, for the Life Discovery Doing Science Education Conference. Uh, my presentation will be an, an introduction to the four dimensional ecology education framework, which is also known as 4DEE. The framework is proving to be an exciting way to teach ecology at the undergraduate and the graduate levels and the secondary levels as well. And it was endorsed by the ESA's governing board uh, back in uh, November of 2018. So by way of introduction, uh, the past few decades have been really an interesting time to teach biology in uh, general and ecology in particular. It's been a period of considerable self-reflection and innovation uh, at issues have been concerns over a perceived lack of scientific literacy among the general population. And so in 1986, outgoing president of BSA, Paul Risser, uh, focused his address at the annual meeting on the state of ecological literacy. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands in terms of how many people were actually at his presentation. I actually remember it quite well and he urged ecologists to take steps to remedy the lack of ecology understanding by improving ecology education at various levels. So in the decades or in the years that followed, ecologists grappled with the issue of ecological literacy. First, by defining what we mean by ecological literacy, and then by developing strategies for improving ecological knowledge among our students and the general public. One result of that effort has been the emergence of a, of a literature on that topic. And so examples of some of the articles are shown on this slide. Uh, again, there's something that I published back in 1991. Um, uh, the David Orr had, had a, a book that he published on ecological literacy and then Alan Berkowitz and then others um, published articles uh, in the peer-reviewed literature on uh, what do we mean by ecological literacy. Uh, so we have a lot of effort that went into this, this, this general task um, and the, the idea of easily defining ecological literacy we found uh, proved to be an elusive task. Well, within the past decade, uh, several publications and initiatives uh, provided an impetus for the development of a framework for ecological literacy. In 2009, you have up here, uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, published, uh, along with um, a, a, a medical organization, uh, published a, a document that was entitled Scientific Foundations for Future uh, Physicians. And so in this document, they actually uh, outlined what they uh, felt were the uh, science and actually non-science requirements uh, that future physicians uh, should be, um, uh, should be uh, uh, taught. Uh, but one of the things that we found distressing is that ecology was not in there at all. And so Beck et al. Et al. Uh, then suddenly wrote an article in Science 
uh, basically arguing for ecological, uh, uh, e ecological literacy and the idea that ecology needs to be taught. But the question is, what, what would be the framework for teaching ecology? Then we had other, um, uh, other uh, uh, events that occurred as well. Course Source, which is an online journal, um, interacted with the Ecological Society and they said, uh, what do you have in terms of a framework? And so the ESA at the point had, had nothing. Uh, ESA certification standards, again, require that uh, we have some idea of uh, what we want people to know with regard to ecology. Uh, there were repeated requests or occasional requests to the ESA's Education and Diversity Office for um, uh, pu uh, publications relating to uh, what the framework is. And then there were also concerns about whether ecology was even valuable to teach at the uh, undergraduate level, um, especially with the emergence of molecular biology. So all these events uh, all led to uh, a framework for uh, e uh, at least a compelling need for a framework for ecological literacy. So for those reasons, the ESA impaneled a group of educators active within the society to develop a framework for teaching ecology. And again, you can see the names are right here of those of us who were assembled to uh, meet this task. Um, initially, the framework that we put together consisted of a, se a set of concepts that followed the familiar ecological or ecological hierarchy. And so concepts relating to populations and communities and ecosystems were all incorporated. Well, as we met with groups of ecologists and other educators, it became evident that a single linear array of concepts would not be satisfactory. So for example, we can ask, where do we put evolution? What about disturbance and recovery? What about systems? What about the skills that students need to have? And of, of great importance, what about the impact of humans on ecological systems and the impact of those systems on humans? So we did a lot of soul searching and a lot of thinking about what we could be doing here. And so we settled on a, fr a framework uh, that consisted of multiple dimensions. And so eventually we had this framework that you're seeing here that was made up of a four dimensional um, array of, of concepts, concepts and practices. And so this framework became known as the four dimensional ecology education or four DEE framework. So we can ask then what are those dimensions? And so the first one consists of the familiar ecology concepts or the hierarchy. The second consists of ecological practices, the things that we want students to be able to do. The third thing would be to discuss human and environment interactions and the interactions go both ways. And then we have this cross cutting themes as being our fourth dimension. So what defines these dimensions? Well, let me take a deeper dive and tell you what we, um, what we came up with. So the first dimension would be the ecological concepts. And so this is the familiar ecology hierarchy. And so we start off with the ecology of individuals, then populations, communities, ecosystems, landscapes, biomes, and the biosphere. And so um, we have then uh, the, the ecology concepts that fit in uh, to these various dimensions. Then as far as dimension two goes, this is eco ecology practices. What do we want students to be able to know how to do? And so we start off and we had some discussion about where do we put natural history and we felt that, he, that natural history actually belongs in ecology practices rather than along one of the other dimensions. And then we felt that field work was very important. Uh, quantitative reasoning was important for ecologists uh, because ecology is a science. How do we design and critique um, the investigations that we do and the investigations that others do? 
um, working collaboratively, even though we have a, a lone student here, uh, what you don't see are other students who are off doing some measuring. And so um, uh, we have a student here who is recording. And so working collaboratively was, uh, collaboratively was felt as being important. And then communicating and applying ecology, we felt also was an important skill to have. So ecology practices, the skills that we give our students uh, represent dimension two. As far as dimension three goes, we have human environment interactions. And so um, this again is, is something that sometimes is put toward the end of the semester if we, if we include it at all. But what we're getting at here would be what are some of the benefits that ecosystems uh, or ecological systems in general have to people and so these would be ecosystem services. By the same token, how do humans impact the environment? So human impact that accelerated environmental change is another component of this. And then we have applied areas of ecology, such as agroecology, conservation biology, urban ecology, and then natural resource management as being um, application areas for the human and environment interactions. And then we also have ethical dimensions that are included. And so something like environmental justice would go here under the human environment interactions. Well, as far as dimension four goes, dimension four would be the cross cutting themes. These are concepts and, and activities and um, other aspects of teaching ecology that really don't get conveniently pigeonholed into any one area. And so generally structure and function can be thought of as being a cross-cutting theme. The pathways and transformation of matter and energy, um, obviously very important and this could, include, this could uh, consist of uh, different or be applied to different levels of the ecological hierarchy. Systems in general would be uh, another one. Uh, spatial and temporal scales have an impact all the way from individual organisms up to the biosphere. Uh, stability and change, we could say the same thing for that. And then evolution, uh, we believe is, is very important as well as a cross-cutting theme as is the, the area of biogeography. All right, so now that you're familiar with the dimensions, what are some of the noteworthy features of this framework? Well, the first thing is that 4DEE is scalable. In other words, you can apply it to an individual lesson or lab. You can apply it to an entire course. You can apply it to a course sequence and you can apply it to an entire curriculum. And in fact, there are a few schools that have actually gone the route of, of restructuring their entire curricula around 4DEE. So that would be the, the first thing. The second thing is that 4DEE is accessible. And so uh, assessment is obviously an important aspect of teaching. And so we can ask then, insightful questions about um, student understanding of ecology by seeing if they can identify their knowledge along each of the four dimensions. And you wanna be explicit about this. Also, um, we can ask whether students can integrate knowledge across the dimensions. And I think as far as the integration goes, I'll say a few more words about that, but Luana has a lot more to say about the integration component. Then we also have found out that, and we, uh, we surmised that 4DEE spurs innovation, collaboration, and research. So for example, you can ask whether certain approaches to your teaching by using 4DEE are more effective than other approaches. And so that research is then publishable, especially in journals like the Bulletin of the Ecological Society where actually I happen to be the undergraduate section editor uh, for that. And so I'm welcoming of uh, manuscripts that deal with the 4DEE. Uh, likewise, ESA's EcoEd library, the digital library, 
is also welcoming of resources that embrace the four DEE approach. The next thing is that um, uh, four DEE is uh, consistent with AAAS's vision and change initiative. Um, and so like 4DE, vision and change, if you're familiar with it, is also multidimensional, except we include one more dimension uh, that vision and change doesn't include, which is namely the human dimension. All right, so 4DE is also relevant to the certification program. I, I mentioned this very briefly before, and so here we have a hardworking ecologist out in the field uh, doing a wetland delineation. And so, um, so the, the, the program itself needs a way to determine whether we call baseline knowledge of ecology and the 4DEE provides an, a, frame, a framework to help guide uh, the certification process to that end. Finally, um, 4DEE can provide an argument to administrators like department heads and deans for including ecology in the biology curriculum. This is especially important in those departments that look to de-emphasize ecology in favor of molecular biology. So we, we found this, uh, this out by certain uh, programs that have incorporated the 4DEE and we, we see that, that uh, administrators uh, really, really like this stuff. They really eat it up. So, um, so we have then the, uh, this argument as well. So the question is, how do you go about incorporating 4DEE into your courses? Well, the first thing is that what you wanna do is to actually survey your syllabus relevant to the four dimensions. And so what you might wanna start off with is implementing across two or three of the dimensions, but actually um, based on discussions with other faculty, I found that, that many faculty are already doing the 4DEE without really even realizing it. So they're, they're I guess, pre-adapted uh, for that purpose. And so um, the other thing then is that maybe you just need to add uh, the human environment interactions, incorporate that a little bit more explicitly or ecological practices um, to the concepts that you might teach in your course in order to be able to give students more skills. Well, related to the previous suggestions, you wanna go for low hanging fruit. In other words, to be able to pick and choose among the concepts that you teach and to see which are amenable to the 4DEE approach. So as an example, I teach a unit on wetlands that actually I'm gonna talk about in uh, the next session. And I teach this in a field botany course. And it was easy to take this unit on wetlands and actually to extract out certain parts of it as being relevant to the 4DEE framework. On the other hand, I also teach about gradient analysis and it's, it's a little bit less amenable to applying the 4DEE to that uh, than it would be to the wetland session. The next thing we could do is to get our students to be able to take more ownership of their, of their learning. And so if they can devise one or two of the dimensions in a unit they teach or even in a course that you teach, um, uh, they're, they're able to, uh, as I said, uh, take more ownership of their learning. And so as an example, if you teach water use efficiency in plants, which is a uh, physiological concept that would belong to the, the hierarchical end, um, you can ask how would that concept be applicable to a farmer, uh, which would be more of a applied aspect. Um, asking students to develop uh, material, as I said, um, allows them to take ownership of their, of their learning. So the other thing that we can do is to think about the ways in which interactions occur between dimensions. And so you don't want to just simply have the four dimensions and not see how to intertwine them. Again, as I mentioned, uh, Luana will be able to talk about that a little bit more detail. 
but I know that as an example, in my wetland unit, uh, we discuss ways that a plant community is able to process energy. Or we also know um, I can give students the ability to identify wetlands in the field, and that will promote conservation at the level of the watershed. So anyway, that's, that's my introduction to 4DEE. And so I look forward to inter interacting with you on the panel, as well as throughout the rest of the conference. And so here I have my contact information here. Um, and so I uh, hope you have a great conference. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, really interesting um, ideas. And I think some ideas that will really set us up well for the rest of, of this conference. So um, I want to remind everyone that we will do the question and answers at the end of both of our keynote speakers. So um, I see we have three questions so far in our question and answer box. Um, and we have some people upvoting, which is also excellent. So um, please continue to add to those um, throughout our second um, speaker's keynote. And uh, then at the very end, we will have both of our speakers answering these questions. So please um, keep contributing there. Um, and uh, I'd like to now introduce um, our second key keynote speaker, uh, Luana Prevo, who is uh, the incoming chair of this committee. So we have the found one of the founders and um, then our new leadership here. Um, really nice book ended talk. Uh, she is an associate professor of integrative biology at the University of Southern Florida, and she got her PhD from the University of Georgia. Uh, her research on biology education um, focuses on a variety of aspects, including um, obviously uh, ecology literacy, um, but also at, on using uh, student writing as, as a strategy for um, developing understanding in biology. So again, I'll keep my intro short so you can hear from our main speakers, um, but let's all welcome uh, Luana Prevo. Thank you so much, Arietta, and thank you everyone for being here with us today for the sixth LDC. Um, today, I'll take the pleasure of talking to you guys a little bit more about the 4DEE framework and specifically talking about uh, multidimensional learning. As, um, Arietta said, I am at the University of South Florida and my focus is biology education research. I do um, a lot of work on assessment as well as some faculty development. Today, we're going to focus on how this framework can help us um, not just have a list of um, concepts or practices that we want students to interact with, but to take a connecting or integrative approach to using the framework in our courses. So as Ken mentioned, there are a number of people working on this framework and I'd like to thank them all for their contributions over the years. This has been a culmination of um, the work of many individuals and it provides the field of ecology as well as the society with a framework that we can use to develop educational programming at many levels. Now 4DEE builds on other um, multidimensional frameworks in science education. For example, as Ken mentioned, vision and change. Here we have an example of a two-dimensional framework for biology education, where we focus on concepts that we want students who have a biology education, undergraduate education, to be able to, to know and understand. And we focus on core competencies. What do we want these students to do in order to be biologically literate? 4DEE also builds on a three-dimensional framework. So within K-12 science education, we have this three-dimensional framework that um, led to the next generation science standards and it focuses on the core ideas, which are similar to the concepts within a discipline, practices like those Ken talked about and those that you might find in a vision and change, but also cross-cutting concepts that connect multiple disciplinary um, areas within STEM. So for example, looking at systems, looking at patterns and scales, which are important across science and engineering. So if we take a look at the framework, 
We can see that this parallels in ecology, con ecology concepts, ecology practices, and cross-cutting frameworks. This new dimension, the human environmental environment interactions came across through um, asking the members of the ESA, Ecological Society of America, what would they want people to know, feel, or be able to do in order to be ecologically literate? From this survey, we found out, as um, in other disciplines, we have an interest in concepts, we have an interest in, interest in the process of science, and also in science skills. But this um, human ecology concepts was a unique dimension that arose from the ideas of ecologists. So we incorporate these into what is now the human inter environment interactions. So Ken mentioned um, what the different um, components of the concepts are. And for the human dimension interactions, those may vary from um, incorporating ideas of climate change, environmental justice, and ethics into the curriculum. So why this new or relatively new push towards a multidimensional learning? Um, it helps us focus on not only what we want students to know and do, but also to help students make explicit connections across STEM disciplines. For example, we can ask also students, are they connecting what, we, what they are, are now learning in class to their, their own um, lived experiences? So connecting science and people. And today I will focus on making those connections. So as Ken said, you want to start pretty slowly. So whilst we make these connections, it's maybe implicit to us as, in, um, as instructors, but we want to make them also explicit to our students. And in doing so, we can focus on learning objectives. So for example, many of us use components that are part of these um, four dimensions in our classrooms already. For example, someone teaching introductory biology or ecology may already want students to focus on ecological interactions. It's a concept within ecology, but it also ties to the concept of systems. So already you may have two dimensional um, learning objectives in your course. We can now try to make those connections between these two dimensions and a third dimension explicit. So how, what practice do we want students to undertake while understanding ecological interactions? So we may ask them to draw or construct a model. We may ask them to use a model to make predictions. So by doing so, we've now have students explicitly making these connections. And then we can ramp up even a little bit more once we've had more time um, experimenting with this four dimensional approach and not only ask students to maybe interpret data and focus it, focused on determining an ecological interaction, but we may also ask them to use that data to find out about the impact of human activities on these interactions. So today I will give a short example of this within a context of introductory biology. The framework, while it was um, determined within the Ecological Society of America, it can extend to other avenues where we incorporate ecology, making ecology more accessible to students regardless of their background or major. So in this case, we created a, um, a module or case study where students were going to examine the causes and impacts of BD kind on the environment and the implications for society. This was actually a student voted topic. So the students already have um, input and ownership of this topic. Something that many faculty do on instructors is to base um, different um, case studies or modules on the literature. So that's another practice that we can incorporate into a 4DE course or module. And the activities and worksheets, worksheets and clicker questions may be familiar to many people. 
So by incorporating the framework and explicitly connecting the objectives, you don't necessarily have to entirely revamp your course. You can modify what you have based on um, the other um, practices that we found to be um, best practices in teaching biology. And of course, a variety of assessments can be used. When you're connecting across the dimensions, as I mentioned, it does not have to be um, all or nothing. So here we have an example of a two-dimensional approach where it could be a clicker question for a large class or followed by small group discussion, or if you have a smaller class, it's just small group discussion where you integrate the human interaction, human environment interaction, and um, also quantitative reasoning a practice. This can slowly ramp up. So other activities within this particular lesson were three-dimensional or four-dimensional, asking students again to practice data interpretation related to a particular concept within a context where humans are present or asking students to use a model to predict impacts based on human interventions into a particular ecosystem. So while in these examples, we see a two, three and four dimensional activity, overall the lesson can be considered four dimensional where each, each component does not have to be. So there is a lot of room for flexibility on how you approach, but again, making each of these explicit to students. Of course, to encourage students to interact with the lesson and the instructional activity to achieve the learning objectives, we want to use assessment that drives and fosters this type of multidimensional approach. So studies have shown that assessment can drive how students study, where they um, place their attention. So we also wanna focus on four dimensional assessments or multidimensional assessments. And we'll talk about this more at the 4DEE showcase um, tomorrow. We want to make sure there's this alignment between learning objectives, instructional activities and assessments to drive this multidimensional approach. 4DEE also helps students connect to authentic learning contexts. So you can use 4DEE a framework for high engagement, um, high impact practices, such as community engagement or research and field experiences, because these often integrate the practices. So for example, designing an experiment or the human dimension determining um, how certain ecological eff effects may impact policies that are um, implemented within a certain community. So by having students um, conduct these, uh, use the 4DE framework, they're conducting their learning in a more authentic environment. Additionally, by connecting the dimensions, we can encourage more inclusive educational approaches. For example, the human interaction dimension often fosters students to um, share their experiences, to have choice and ownership of the material, as Ken mentioned. So for example, in the study um, or the module I presented earlier, students had a choice of what human impact they would examine and thus there was higher engagement with the materials. Additionally, students may want to find out how they can contribute to the, what's going on in their local communities and thus having this four dimensional approach could support this. Whilst they conduct these practices as they are learning concepts, they can help build a sense of self-efficacy and community by working collaboratively and also by practicing the skills that they'll be using in other courses, in graduate school, in the workforce. And of course, we always want to connect to these cross courting concepts because students' interests are never unidimensional. They may be avid ecologists, but also have interest in other areas as well. And by connecting to the whole student, looking at how we can show the connections 
between ecology and other um, cross-cutting concepts, we might be better able to reach our students and um, engage with their interests. 40 EES Ken mentioned is applicable across the curriculum. And I won't talk much more about this particular slide because there's gonna be a lot more discussion about it on Saturday, talking about how you can implement across the curriculum. But I will mention that it makes us think a little bit more about how we organize. So making sure we connect at the lesson. Maybe we don't have to always focus on all the content within a course or within a program because we connect different dimensions in different parts of the courses or different parts of a program. And it also helps us think of our students and how they connect outside our discipline. So outside ecology and biology, are they interested in economics? Are they interested in policy? What are the other things that drive students to learn about ecological interactions and the environment? So that might ask us to do a little bit work, more work as instructors and connect outside our disciplines, which may in turn help us build collaborations that foster student learning even more. So with that, I want to mention this, this showcases and the workshops that are coming up every day for the um, rest of the conference. The next, after we finish this um, keynote and panel, we'll be, um, Ken will be talking more about actually building these lessons. So that will be a great one. And then there'll be other opportunities later. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone and I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I see we have um, some questions for both of our keynote speakers in the chat. So I just want to remind people briefly of um, this idea, this framework that Andy introduced at the beginning, this idea of um, taking space, making space. So if you're not familiar with that framework, um, the idea is that if you are a shyer person, a person whose voice is not as often heard in these situations, you're encouraged to take that space. Um, and if you are a person who is more comfortable speaking up, who's often listened to, um, and I think we all know who we are, um, people who feel comfortable <laughs> speaking up in large groups, um, uh, you're encouraged to maybe wait a little bit, still participate, but maybe um, leave space for, for those shyer people or people who might feel less comfortable contributing. Um, one of the reasons Life Discovery is one of my very favorite conferences is because when we're in person, it does such a great job of providing an inclusive environment and helping conversations happen between participants. It's one of the only meetings where I feel like I meet, I meet people that I didn't have any connections to before and that this happens whether you want it to or not, right? You don't have to work for it um, because the conference is set up. And so I'm really hoping that in this online framework, we can keep that same environment. Um, and so these other, um, these other opportunities, the um, showcase and then the workshop um, later today um, for the 40E will be another way for you to, to interact and build those connections. But for now, let's start with our um, Q&A. So I'm going to just read out um, the text questions in the Q&A and then open it up to our speakers um, in terms of, uh, so, so if you can please put them in the chat and also upvote because I'm going to read them basically in order of uh, uh, how many people have voted for being interested in hearing this question. So the first question on our list is from Drew Hazley and it is with regard to field work within practices, does this mean an understanding of field work and where the data come from, or does it require ability to go into field situations? In other words, is doing field work a gatekeeper for someone being allowed to learn ecology or become an ecology ecologist? So, um, and we have a, a reply to this question from Jessica Pratt. That this is also an important question we are discussing as our field biology courses are currently remote. Uh, it allows us to think about accessibility in a different way. Okay, so let me let me try to take a stab at this and let me try to keep this under an hour, if possible. Um, this is actually a very important question and one that we've discussed, uh, you know, in our in our formative meetings of 4DEE. Um, there are actually a number of uh, field work initiatives that are going that are underway uh, nationally. Uh, there's uh, the one that I'm really familiar with is something called UFERN. Um, but there are, there are others that are out there as well. 
And so um, I, I think that, that your, your question is, it was phrased in kind of an either or manner. You know, does this mean understanding of field work or where the data come from, or does it require an ability to go in field situations? Um, I think that, that I would say both uh, are, are important. However, if, if there are situations in which uh, we can't get our students out into the field, uh, I, I don't want to necessarily say uh, that that would be a deal breaker for anybody going into uh, the area of ecology. Um, certainly, there's a lot of theoretical ecology that's out there, um, but uh, typically, um, I, I think that that if you can if you can get your students out into the field uh, to see, you know, this is where uh, plants and animals live and grow. Um, I think that would be a uh, a desirable thing. Yeah, and I would ag agree with Ken. Um, we we do want students who are interested in ecology to be able to explore the nature, the natural world. Um, as we know right now, like um, Jessica responded in this online environment, it has changed drastically, and that has actually opened up the experience for groups that we have sometimes overlooked or not have given enough access. So by thinking more about how we can introduce stu um, students to field work, we might actually be able to include more people into the field of ecology. But at the same time, we are aware that not everyone has to be a gung-ho and field, um, field work enthusiastics and many important contributions have come from ecologists that have taken a theoretical approach. So I think it's a both and situation as well. Yeah, okay. Great, thank you both. Um, I also wanted to add something from a participant in the text chat, um, Jillian Schultz, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name, um, is this idea that people can even do ecology in their own homes, right? Our homes are ecosystems. So uh, Rob Dunn, uh, who was actually on my PhD committee, side note, um, uh, has a bunch of work on this and a book, um, Never Home Alone. So um, that is a, another great idea from, from my uh, participant. Um, great, so let's look I, at our next. Jump in. I, I know that there are, there are people who have actually done taxonomic studies of organisms that you find in your home. And I, I think there's an average of eight or nine different major taxa that we have in our homes at any one time. Somebody might be more familiar with that research, but yeah, I, I, I echo that sentiment. Great, so let's go to our next question. Um, this is from a question posted anonymously, so that's always an option. Uh, this uh, person says, 40E is brand new to me and I feel like I'm missing something. I understand the topics in the four dimensions, but I don't understand how organizing the topics along those dimensions constitutes a teaching approach. And this is a question from earlier, and they also said that perhaps it'll be clear, um, become clear as we go along, but this is also upvoted by many people, so it seems like it's still a question for many. Hmm. Luana, do you want to take this one first? Sure. So like many frameworks, it is an organizing approach that can encompass a variety of, of pedagogies. So for example, if we take um, the vision and change, for example, we are focusing on students, the concepts you want students to know and the practices you want students to do, but we use that as an organizing framework and of course, we're going to delve a little bit deeper. So similarly with the 4DEE, it's an organizing approach that helps us as um, instructors reflect, okay, so um, what am I interested in my students knowing, doing, connecting with? And then we might use it as a way to self-assess our instruction and think about where are the gaps? Where can I focus more? Am I integrating or connecting the concepts? So it's more of a framework for reflecting on our instruction and providing students with explicit ways to connect versus um, necessarily saying it's a new pedagogical approach because we do incorporate um, other best practices, you know, working collaboratively, trying to make sure the classroom is inclusive. Okay. Great. Do you have something to add, Ken? Yeah, uh, I, I think it, it's, um, it goes back to the, 
uh, developmental biology, uh, if you want to use that, that concept of, of how 4DEE came about. And the idea is that we were originally tasked with the idea of, or with the task of, of coming up with a linear array of concepts. And the more that we got into it, the more that we realized that a, that a single linear array um, doesn't really work. And that actually the way that, that, that we want to think about our teaching is according to these multiple dimensions. Um, I think that, that one of the things that 4DE does for us is that it really elevates the human component. Um, because in many cases, uh, human ecology is either presented toward the end of the course or not presented at all. And there was a strong sentiment, you know, based on the survey that Luana pr uh, provided, but also within the various meetings on an integrate the human approach um, as strongly as you might some of the more basic ecological approaches as well. And so um, on that basis, you know, we feel comfortable in presenting, you know, this particular approach as a teaching approach. Great. So um, moving down our Q and A, um, we have a question on assessment. Um, from Simon Bird. Do you have any ideas, thoughts, or tested means for assessment in terms of evaluating the impacts of utilizing this framework course by course or more broadly? So that's a question I love because right yeah. now we are thinking about this, right? And we, um, the committee would enjoy working with other um, faculty or researchers that are working on assessment. Um, right now, um, one of the ways to assess is to look at some of the things that we already know are important in the classroom. So our students um, working collaboratively, our students able to feel like, uh, get a sense of belonging, inclusion in the, within the, the classroom. But also we want to evaluate other impacts, especially with this integrated approach. One of the things that we have um, as, uh, that we are trying to develop now are more multidimensional assessments, because without a multidimensional assessment, it is really difficult to evaluate a multidimensional approach. So um, Simon, if you are interested, um, please contact us. We are looking for other people who are interested in this work. Okay, and let me, let me just fully agree with everything Luana just said. That, that's really good. Great. Okay. So okay. our next question is from an anonymous, um, is an anonymous question again, which is asking, are there any case studies or other resources on the topic of the microbiome and or parallels between the human microbiome, microbiome services and ecology slash ecosystem services? Okay, so let me, let me try to take this one. So um, uh, I have personally not seen any, uh, any lesson plans or, or anything that, that links together for DEE with the microbiome, um, I think that might be a, a, an unexplored area that deserves uh, to be explored. Um, and so again, as the editor for the undergraduate section of the bulletin, uh, boy, if you could come up with something that would, uh, that would relate to that uh, interaction there, um, that would be something that, that uh, I, I would love to see a, an article that could be, um, uh, accepted within the bulletin. Great. Did you have anything to add, Luana? Um, no, just recommend what Ken said. Great. Um, all right. Our um, next question is asking about existing textbooks um, from Jessica Pratt. Are there existing texts that you feel do well at taking a 40 EE approach to its organization and presentation of content? Sometimes textbooks feel constraining in the way that topics are divided among chapters. Um, and we have an additional comment on this question from Nathan Rule. And again, apologies for mispronouncing people's names, um, which is, um, he commented that we did a course alignment to 40E this summer at my institution. And while we agreed on the importance of 40E and a common course alignment, we could not agree on a common textbook. So this is um, perhaps a common um, issue that people are having um, across institutions. 
Okay. And so we, we've talked to a few textbook uh, publishers and we agree that uh, I guess as a committee, um, none of us have really felt that there's an existing text that really links up with 4DEE all that well. Uh, certainly something that, um, you know, again, could be explored and implemented in the future. So maybe the, the short answer to your question is no. Great, so hopefully coming soon. <laughs> um, uh, all right. Let's see what is next. Um, uh, also, I wanted to point out that people are adding a lot of really excellent um, resources and ideas in the chat. So please keep an eye on that. There's some recommendations for microbiome resources, um, another book from Rob Dunn, Wildlife of the Bodies, um, and a book um, from uh, Ed Young's um, Ed Young uh, wrote, I Contain Multitudes, so another microbiome approach. So lots of great things being shared there. Please keep those coming. Um, uh, we have another question now on assessment. So uh, is anyone working on a 40EE rubric to help TIEE or um, EcoEd Net um, Ecology Educational Submissions? Such a rubric could be posted on these sites under instructions for authors. Um, okay, so yeah, we do have a rubric that we're putting together. Uh, there's a fellow, I can't remember his name, but a fellow from Cornell, who's actually um, done a lot of really good work uh, in, the, in the area of putting together a rubric. And so we have a subcommittee within our main committee um, to help uh, this process along. Uh, by the way, the, the other thing I do want to mention just on an organizational level is that while we do have this uh, this committee uh, that that meets really every two weeks by by phone, uh, we have a bunch of subcommittees that are spinning off, and we love to see people participating in these various subcommittees. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're interested in uh, uh, serving on one of these subcommittees, uh, please by all means either contact myself or contact uh, Luana or contact Teresa at ESA. And, um, you know, we love to, to move this process forward. Great, and perhaps this is something that could come up in um, some of the uh, workshopping sessions later. Um, for the, I think that's yeah, so Justin sent Juliana at um, Cornell. He's developed a, um, a rubric uh, we also um, encourage um, submissions to um, EcoEd. Um, Ken has an example on there that we can use um, of his, uh, like for example, connecting the syllabus to 4DEE. So um, if you uh, are looking for some of those resources, um, available, but are trying to develop more. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, Luana, if you could, if you don't mind putting the name of that person in the in the answer chat, or you can just chat to me and I'll add it um, so that people can can look look him up for that rubric. Um, so we have actually gotten through all of our open questions in the text chat, um, and we still have eight minutes remaining in this session. So um, any other questions, feel free to add them there, or you can also, um, if you like, raise your blue hand in the participants um, box if you'd like to ask a question. So once you do that, then you can um, be invited to, uh, we'll call on you and you can be invited to unmute yourself and, and ask your question that way. Great. Thank you so much for the rubric, Wayne. All right, looks like we're, we're actually doing an excellent job at staying on time. And thank you so much to both of our keynote speakers. Um, some really, really interesting ideas to get us really set a foundation for, for the rest of um, this conference. Uh, Andy? Hi. So thanks, Luana and Ken and, and Arietta and everybody, all the panelists. Um, I mean, sorry, all the participants. That was that was a great session. Just a reminder. So, if um, Teresa, do you want to put up the? Yeah, great. 
So just a reminder, so we have a break about for about 20, 20 minutes now, although um, you should plan on arriving early if you can to the Zoom rooms. So our next event is the 4DE showcase at 1230. And so uh, we look forward to seeing you then.